Klashnikov, 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 Klashnikov. This is a war song. This is a war song. This is a war song. Maybe we can put the guns down and pick up the law. They want me to keep my voice down. But I need to speak up There's a war going on outside Turning our city to dust But if we stand strong, they'll be gone This is a war song Catch me The Belt and Road Wars, a new Cold War 2.0 has begun. The bankers have used their considerable resources to restructure the planet and create this new Belt and Road Initiative, thus creating the long-anticipated Eurasia in order to counterbalance what they would call Oceania, also known as NATO, in the final Great War to control the populations. A war in which the world is divided into two camps, NATO versus the BRICS nations, Oceania versus Eurasia. Didn't you know we've always been at war with Eurasia? This final war being created by the banksters is the war from 1984. And I quote, The war, therefore if we judge it by the standards of previous wars, is merely an imposture. It is like the battles between certain ruminant animals whose horns are incapable of hurting one another. But though it is unreal, it is not meaningless. It eats up the surplus of consumable goods, and it helps to preserve the special mental atmosphere that the hierarchical society needs. War, it will be seen, is now a purely internal affair. In the past, the ruling groups of all countries, although they might recognize their common interest and therefore limit the destructiveness of war, did fight against one another, and the victor always plundered the vanquish. In our own day, they are not fighting against one another at all. The war is waged by each ruling group against its own subjects, and the object of the war is not to make or prevent conquests of territory, but to keep the structure of society intact 
The very word war, therefore, has become misleading. It would probably be accurate to say that by becoming continuous, war has ceased to exist. The peculiar pressure that is exerted on human beings between the Neolithic age and the early 20th century has disappeared and has been replaced by something quite different. The effect would be much the same if the three superstates, instead of fighting one another, should agree to live in perpetual peace, each in bullet within its own boundaries, for in that case each would still be a self-contained universe, freed forever from the sobering influence of external danger. A peace that was truly permanent would be the same as a permanent war. This, although the vast majority of party members understand, in only a shallower sense, is the inner meaning of the party slogan, War is Peace. And that is the also meaning of the war against Eurasia. The war between the BRICS and the NATO nations. It's a war by the powers that shouldn't be against their own people that will never end and will never strike a winning blow against their foes. The bankers love their ancient plans, and as you can see here, the ancient Silk Road is what they are trying to revive with the Belt and Road Initiative, and this is what they're doing in order to restructure the planet to a ancient trade system. Just as the modern Belt and Road Initiative has a maritime route, and an overland route, the ancient Silk Road had the same. As you see here, the Via Maris, which was the overwater route, the coastal highway. You also had the overland routes, such as the King's Highway. All of these routes made ancient Israel the trade center of all of Eurasia, the middle point between east and west, and they are doing the same in the modern day era. The Belt and Road Initiative is actually depicted in an ancient map called the Heinrich Bunting Map. And this map depicts Asia, Europe, and Africa as a new Eurasian superstate with Jerusalem as the capital. This ancient Silk Road has been rebuilt in the modern day with technology and smart city applications yet it is still the same ancient plan to unite East with Europe, to unite German high technology to Russian raw resources and Chinese labor. The Belt and Road Initiative is a major departure from the systems that we understand the world to be run by today, an interlocking and intertwining system, a matrix of control that has been run by the New World Order. For a long time, we had been marching towards a world of a one world government. Now the world has been split into two. No longer are we ever seeing increasing trade between the two world's largest trading partners, the United States and China. The world which was once dominated by the United States has been slowly shifting over time to be dominated by the CCP as the bankers have shifted the power to the East. As you can see from the turn of the century, America was dominating the global trade market. And now thanks to the Belt and Road Initiative, which has been funded by the banks, there's China is dominating the global trade market by the year 2020. China's Belt and Road Initiative in seeking to connect China to Central Asia and eventually to Europe will have the practical significance of shifting the world center of gravity from the Atlantic to the Pacific and will involve the cultures of Eurasia, each of whom will have to decide what relationship to this vision they will seek and so will the United States. This is why many of us urge the United States to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank when it was proposed 
by China. The international monetary order, the global banksters, are not about nations anymore at this point. It's about the multipolar world order that is able to control people and this pivot to the east, the buildup of China by handing them technology and linking them in with Russia to create a new Belt and Road world order with Israel at the center. And we say it's the banksters behind this because they are. The connections between the World Economic Forum and the rise of the Belt and Road, the rise of the Eurasian super state are clear. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, as Henry Kissinger was stating, is one of the main banks funding the new Silk Road projects. And you can see AIIB President Jin Liquan addressing the WEF and the connections between the AIIB and the WEF are never ending. One of the obvious objectives of the AIIB and the WEF is this push to hurt the Western nations like the United States that are oil producing nations because China has no oil of its own. So all of this push, as you can see here from the AIIB, which is similar to the WEF push, for sustainable development is to hurt Western nations like the United States and to benefit countries like China that have no oil of their own. There are many nations involved in this revival of the Silk Road, including Iran, which has been making many deals as part of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. And because the banksters no longer care about nations, there are other countries that are a part of this network that would seemingly be at odds with each other, such as Iran and Israel, yet they're both willing to work on the same large multinational projects. You are an old man who thinks in terms of nations and peoples. There are no nations. There are no peoples. There are no Russians. There are no Arabs. There are no third worlds. There is no West. And because there are no nations, just economic policies, you see China is now joining with Israel on the Belt and Road Initiative, even though China has already joined with Iran on the same Belt and Road Initiative, and these are enemies of each other. And you can see the World Bank is promoting the Belt and Road Initiative, despite the fact that the Belt and Road Initiative mainly benefits China and Russia, and of course the Israeli state when it's completed, yet we are in currently a situation where everyone wants you to think the bankers are against Russia, yet here are the bankers promoting the Belt and Road Initiative that benefits Russia because it's not about nations, it's about money. There is only one holistic system of systems. One vast and immane, interwoven, interacting, multivariate, multinational dominion of dollars. Petrodollars, electrodollars, multidollars, Reichmarks, rims, rubles, pounds, and shekels. If you have not seen All Wars Are Banker Wars by Michael Rivero, you should go and check that out either after watching this documentary or hopefully you've seen it before this to get a basic understanding of how the central bankers have been behind every one of the wars in America's history, including the Revolutionary War. And now in the modern day era, the banksters are behind all of the wars that we see currently going on, from Yemen, to Syria, to Ukraine, to recently the coup in Niger, and many other hotspots around the world. The current wars are what I would call the Bankers Belt and Road Initiative Wars, as every one of these current wars has everything to do with the reviving of the Silk Road and the ancient promise of creating a greater Israeli state at the center of this new Eurasian super state. This rise of the Belt and Road Initiative has long been planned, as you can see dating all the way back to 1949, Chairman Mao Zedong meeting with Israel Epstein, Anna Louise Strong, Frank Koh, Solomon Adler, all former members of Roosevelt's cabinet, and the deals between the banksters 
and the CCP have been going back since the creation of the CCP. At the same time the CCP has declared war in the United States, America's quote greatest ally Israel and China are a marriage made in heaven according to Netanyahu. So as their marriage made in heaven is going swimmingly, Israel is scrapping Iron Dome projects because they're refusing to give the key codes to the American military. So at the same time, Israel is working in cahoots with China and with the Chinese military, they are refusing to work with the United States military. And the alternative media, even the anti-Israel alternative media, is not touching this. As this meme says, all the while, of course, the right-wing media is busy promoting the interests of the Zionist movement, and that, above all, is the most important point that needs to be recognized. Although Murdoch and his media play the game of providing an alternative, they are in fact providing a controlled opposition, keeping the conservative and traditional American ranks in line, touting the Zionist cause as an American one. A cause that is fully in line with not just making America great again in the imagery of Ronald Reagan-esque rhetoric, but in reality making America an empire, and one that is ruled by the Zionist elite. In other words, Fox News is loudly and proudly promoting the theme that America is the world's voice for sanity and democracy, and that it is. Quite simply, America's job to rule the world. These enemies within have an international agenda, a perpetual war for perpetual peace, a war not only against global terrorists, but also domestic terrorists as well. And those domestic terrorists are those who stand in the way of the New World Order, which is nothing more than a lifelong Zionist dream of world conquest. When the bankers know you've caught on to their schemes, they like to change the names of their various projects, the Belt and Road Initiative, the revival of the Silk Road, is also called many other things. One of the other things that they call it is the Global Development Initiative, the GDI. What it really is, is United Nations Agenda 2030 repackaged into the multipolar world order. There's an overland economic belt of six corridors that serve as new routes to get goods in and out of China like this railroad connecting China to London, and these gas pipelines from the Caspian Sea to China, and a high-speed train network in Southeast Asia. So one of the interesting things about the spread of the Belt and Road Initiative is as they are creating this BRI, they like to destroy the nations that it grows into before it expands into those nations. We're talking nations like Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Ukraine, now Niger, many of these countries have either entered the Belt and Road Initiative recently or are going to be rebuilt by the Belt and Road Initiative after the wars have ended in those countries. And much like the map from George Orwell's 1984, the disputed territories are all in the disputed territories between Eurasia and East Asia. You can literally map out the Belt and Road Initiative and figure out where the next wars are going to take place. Then there's the Maritime Silk Road, a chain of seaports stretching from the South China Sea to Africa that also directs trade to and from China. The BRI also includes oil refineries, industrial parks, power plants, mines, and fiber optic networks, all designed to make it easier for the world to trade with China. So far, over 60 countries have reportedly signed agreements for these projects. And the list is growing because China promotes it as a win-win for everyone. Take, for example, the BRI's flagship project, Pakistan. The Belt and Road Initiative is no different than what we've seen in the past from things such as the Confessions of an Economic Hitman, which, if you've ever read this book, would describe to you how it works, which is banks loan money to build infrastructure, those loans are based on the fact that the countries building the infrastructure will see large economic growth after that infrastructure is put into place. And then those countries will be able to pay back the loans for that infrastructure because their economies will have grown. That never happens. What ends up happening is the banksters and the countries that make those loans end up going in and taking everything out when those countries can't pay back the loans. And in China's case, 
They like to make those countries give up military bases and other things that have military applications for the Chinese. China's ascent as an international financier has been accompanied by claims that it engages in so-called debt trap diplomacy, which is why countries such as Italy have recently left the Belt and Road Initiative. Western media and senior policy officials seem to feel that China is using the BRI to exert undue influence over the world, especially because the initiative mostly funds infrastructure rather than social sector projects, such as health or education initiatives, that are often favored by large multilateral donors and Western nations. Critics worry that China will be able to seize control of these assets for military use or use them as leverage in future negotiations, and they have taken over some assets for military use already. The Chinese have been using the BRI and the debt trap in order to force countries in Africa to establish in other places military bases. One of the best examples of how this debt trap works is Argentina, which signed a framework for agreement with space cooperation with Beijing, and also took on some of the Belt and Road Initiative money. It was a precursor for the development of the Espacio Lejano Station in Patagonia. The station with its 35 meter diameter antenna and operations run by the China Satellite Launch and Tracking Control General a division of the People's Liberation Army Strategic Support Force remains something of an enigma. Agreed to in 2014 by President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner and Chinese President Xi Jinping and made operational in late 2017, it appears to be a dual-use facility utilized for Chinese civilian and military purposes. Some analysts suggest it could be involved in the Chinese spy balloon that appeared in U.S. airspace earlier this year. Yet absent transparency in Argentine oversight, this cannot be confirmed. Here's one of the only publicly available photographs of the facility from its very early stages, which is now completely under the PRC control and operating in secret. The implementation of the Espacio Lejano was the result of an agreement with secret provisions signed in 2014 between the governments of former Argentine President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner and President Xi Jinping. The agreement, according to Washington-based think tank Center for Strategic and International Studies, specifies that Argentina cannot interfere with or interrupt the normal activities carried out in the cooperation agreement. The secrecy and lack of transparency surrounding the agreement regulating its activities fuel suspicions of dual use and lack of clarity in management, Belakow said. This added to the total absence of Argentine oversight on the activities of extra-regional power in our territory, which is worrisome, especially at this time when the Asian giant's belligerent attitude borders on war threats against Taiwan. In a statement made before U.S. House Armed Services Committee on March 8, 2023, U.S. Army General Laura Richardson, commander of U.S. Southern Command, expressed concerns as the People's Republic of China malign influence in Latin America. The PRC is investing in critical infrastructure, including deep water ports, cyber, and space facilities, which can have a potential dual use for malign commercial and military activities, General Richardson said. Through its Belt and Road Initiative, for example, the PRC is leveraging its overseas investments to force other nations into suboptimal security decisions. I think the One Belt, One Road posture has been a stalking horse to advance Chinese security concerns. Minister Wei said as much in a Latin American conference just last summer. strategic strong points. Now under Chinese law, all ports at home or overseas must be designed to meet PLA standards to accommodate Chinese Navy ships. 
And under China's civil military fusion principle, Chinese port operators, shipping lines, all Chinese companies are legally required to support the PLA, not just in war, but in peacetime as well. What that adds up to is BRI commercial projects that are designed as dual use strategic strong points that could be militarized in the future. This fits with what is called the civilian first military later approach in Chinese doctrine. One of the places that we can see this militarized belt and road expanding currently is into Africa. And I would suggest that in the future, you will likely see a large number of proxy wars on the African continent. So you can see here recently, the Central African Republic has signed a Belt and Road Cooperation Agreement with China, bringing the number of countries involved in the Belt and Road Initiative to 141. The Central African Republic's president said, Quote, I agree with the Communist Party of China's concept of governance and sincerely express my appreciation for the current fruitful cooperation in various fields between our two countries. With the signing of today's memorandum of understanding, I believe the cooperation between China and our country will be closer, Tuadora said. And this is an example of how the Chinese not only force military bases on these people, but also their communist ideology. To counter the growth of the Belt and Road Initiative in Africa, the Western nations, NATO has AFRICOM, which has been involved in some pretty horrific things already. One of those was the 2011 military intervention in Libya, which we all know how that turned out. But what you probably didn't know was that after the dust settled and Gaddafi was beaten to death live on television, China moved into Libya and has exerted the Belt and Road Initiative into a country that was torn apart by the Western nations at the behest of the banking class. Once again, we can see how the Western nations go into a country like Libya, destroy it, and then let the Chinese go in there and pick up the pieces as they try to expand the Eurasian superstate. The current counteroffensive in Africa by the NATO nations is Operation Juniper Shield, which is involved in the African countries primarily Algeria, Chad, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Senegal, Nigeria, and Morocco. And this basically is the NATO nations training forces and using things such as U.S. aid, which is a cover for the CIA to run operations in these countries. And as we will discuss shortly, Niger is another country that was entered into the Belt and Road Initiative and is now suffering from a crazy coup. Another country that has seen 20 years of warfare to end up in the hands of China in the Belt and Road Initiative is Afghanistan. And as can be seen, in the infamous and now famous Americans leaving and Afghanistan's trying to cling to fake cardboard plane scene from Voice of America, America was not only going to pay to destroy Afghanistan, we were going to be embarrassed with how we left and help the Belt and Road Initiative gain massive amounts of momentum. And you will notice that a lot of these Belt and Road Initiative wars, such as Afghanistan, America's role is to go into the country and destroy it at huge expense to the American taxpayer, only to then later bow out and run away from these countries and allow the Chinese and the Russians to manage them in the aftermath as part of the Belt and Road Initiative as the bankers plan. So after 20 years of fighting over one of the most strategically important pieces of dirt in the entire Asian continent, the United States just picks up and leaves in the middle of the night, leaving service dogs and $7 billion worth of military equipment behind the same equipment would then go directly into the hands of the enemies of America and into the new army of the Chinese, the Taliban, which are using to take over Afghanistan for the Belt and Road Initiative as part of the CPEC. 
You must understand for the banksters, it's not about countries, it's about taking over the world. And they're doing that now through the creation of economic corridors, where they're putting multiple nations together and controlling them through finance. And this is the reason and the necessity for the destruction of Afghanistan so it could be rebuilt into this Belt and Road Initiative as part of the CPEC. As you can see through the new road networks that were paid and rebuilt by America to benefit the Chinese, not the United States. It's all about getting Chinese goods to this Gwadar port here in order to connect the overland route with the maritime route of the Belt and Road Initiative. And that's why Afghanistan was destroyed and then handed over to the Taliban. The banking cartel also benefits from the restructuring and rebuilding of Afghanistan after they loaned governments the money to destroy it. A UN agency said last week it requires 4.6 billion this year to help more than two thirds of the country's 40 million population. So as you can see, even after the United States withdrawal, the United Nations and the powers that shouldn't be are still flooding the country with money. And in no surprise, China, Russia, and Iran are among a handful of countries that maintain warm ties with the Taliban. They have provided aid in the tens of millions of dollars to the Taliban, but they have stopped short of formally recognizing the government. Yet, you would think the United States would not have anything to do with this since our withdrawal. However, that's not the case because the bankers have kept America as the largest single donor via humanitarian response by global agencies, providing more than $2.1 billion since the Taliban retook power, according to a report. So as you can see here, the Chinese Taliban forces have not only been armed by America, they've been funded by America. I don't think there is any better example of the banksters funding both sides of a conflict than this one. Another one of these conflicts that is not stopping the creation of the Belt and Road Initiative is this proxy conflict between the state of Iran and Israel, which only seems to exist in the minds of people that cannot see the bigger picture of the creation of the Eurasian superstate and the Belt and Road Initiative. This war goes a lot like this. Iran provides training to the Lebanese forces of Hezbollah. Those forces have to travel back and forth from Lebanon to Iran to get training and weapons. Israel, every once in a while, targets some of their locations or claims it's targeting some of their locations in order to bomb its neighboring countries, which fits into the greater Israel project that we'll get into later in this documentary. In the public eye and to many alt media that are critical of Israel, they will portray the idea that Iran and Israel are at war, when in fact behind the scenes they're making deals as part of this creation of the Eurasian superstate. As you can see here, stories like this are not a shock to people like me. Israel opens first Turkmenistan embassy only 17 kilometers from Iran's border. Hmm. This article here highlights the importance of Iran's role in the Belt and Road Initiative. In a landmark visit to Tehran in January 2016, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Iranian President Hassan Rouhani signed a comprehensive strategic partnership that expanded bilateral ties in trade to US $600 billion over 10 years and formally recognized the Belt and Road Initiative. Later on in the article it reads, Iran is arguably the most influential Belt and Road nation as it directly shapes the expansion of China's Digital Silk Road, Silk Road of Innovation, and Green Silk Road initiatives. Israel is also a part of the Belt and Road Initiative as you can see this new completely automated and brand new port at Haifa which has been designed to help facilitate all of the new trade that will be flowing from China, through Iran, through Israel, to the markets in Europe. So it would seem Iran and Israel are willing to work together behind the scenes on the Belt and Road Initiative, which is hundreds of billions of dollars worth of trade. 
Here's a perfect example in this video of BB Netanyahu trying to use fear tactics to scare Elon Musk into doing what he wants, despite the fact that behind the scenes, the same BB Netanyahu is inking deals with Iran on billion dollar infrastructure projects. I've devoted a good chunk of my, my uh, adult life to preventing Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons because uh, it's a bad actor, you know, it's a chance death to Israel, death to America, and they want to have ICBMs to deliver that threat. You don't want them to be able to reach uh, Fremont or uh, New York or uh, Dallas or any place else yeah. and threaten you and blackmail you. Yeah, I'll tell you a funny anecdote about uh, Iran in this case. Uh, so we, we got permission from the U.S. State Department to turn on Starlink uh, over Iran. And, uh, you know, so there's a few people are using it. And, and we, we got a sort of upset letter from the government of Iran. But actually, the letter was so polite that, I, you know, I expected to be sort of angry or something, but it was polite to a degree that I think, like Charles Dickens level polite, polite you know. And, and I was expecting to see, you know, P.S. Death to America and Israel or something like that. They didn't have that. You so know, I was like, they <laughs> tried to kill the Secretary of State of the United States and the National Security Advisor. I mean, that's really chutzpah, you know. Yeah. So, don't be calm. I just thought it was by Charles Dickens' of, language. No, it was very nice language, but I and I was like, sort of, it would have been just frankly, just pretty epic if it said, "P.S. You know, death to America." <laughs> like, by the way, death to America. I don't know. It was always just. Well, that's an interesting subject, which I hope we can pursue later on today. And of course, as we all know, the Israelis want to wipe out the Palestinians so they can expand their borders. But this applies to the rest of the other nations around them. And the bankers, of course, as always, fund both sides of this, as hilariously described by The Onion. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict began in the wake of the devastating violence of World War II, when international leaders came to the sudden realization that the world no longer had a non-stop carnage-filled conflict with which to entertain itself, and decided that the best course of action would be to lock Israelis and Palestinians in bloody, unrelenting combat for their own amusement. Another one of these never-ending, relentless, Belt and Road Initiative Wars is the Ukraine war, and the end result of the Ukraine war is that Russia and China have been further pushed together, further cementing the creation of the Eurasian superstate. Xi Jinping and Putin have emerged onto the world scene to announce the creation and the formation of the multipolar world order. But who does it benefit? The bankers. In order to have a multipolar world order forever war, you need to create a polar opposite that is equally powerful to what you have in the Anglo-American Empire that is America and the United Kingdom. Thus, the creation of the Eurasian superstate to be that equal opposing force. And as Brendan O'Connor so accurately stated, the main premise of this idea is to take European high technology, especially German high technology, and transfer that to the manufacturing capabilities of the Chinese and to use Russian raw materials and resources in order to power this new Eurasian superstate, thus creating a polar opposite to the United States that's equally as powerful. So in order to do this, you can see stories like this so regularly popping up in the news where advanced technology is being transferred to the Chinese via many different means and from many different sources. But here is a perfect example of German high technology, Dutch space technology being transferred to the Chinese. For Putin, the goal is quite simple and aligns with the banker's plans, and that is to re-establish the Eurasian superstate. And for Putin, it would be one under his control, but he's going to share control with China and Germany in order to re-establish this, because without them, there's no way that this is going to take place. The international bankers have always been behind the Russian state and behind the creation of the Soviet Union since its inception. As this cartoon depicts here, Karl Marx, surrounded by enthusiastic Wall Street financiers, 
Morgan partner George Perkins, J.P. Morgan John Ryan of National City Bank, John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. Immediately behind Marx is Teddy Roosevelt, leader of the Progressive Party. This is a 1911 cartoon. British American German financiers backed the Kerensky and Lenin governments because the Russian czarist regime was highly anti-Semitic and engaged in regular pogroms. One of the leading financiers was Jacob Schiff, who financed other nations in their war efforts. Schiff made sure none of the funds from his loans ever went to the Russian Empire, which he felt oppressed Jewish people. When the Russian Empire fell in 1917, Schiff believed that the oppression of the Jews would end. He formally repealed the impediments within his firm against lending to Russia. As war is politics by other means, the German involvement in the Russia 1917-18 war was war by other means. Sneaking Lenin into Russia was the best shot the Kaiser ever fired. From the History Channel program on the subject, quote, The Germans load a secret weapon onto a heavily guarded train headed for Russia. It's a weapon that promises to destroy their enemies from the inside out. That weapon is Vladimir Lenin. Lenin is the leader of Russia's communist revolutionaries, hell-bent on toppling the Russian Tsar. For the past 10 years, he's been in exile in Switzerland, until Germany sends him home on a train, along with over $10 million to fund his revolution. Later, the Soviet Union slash Russia, which was taken over by the banksters with Lenin, decided they would create another nation and use the nations they controlled to create it. That nation was Israel. In 1947, the Soviet Union surprised the world by announcing that it would support the UN plan for partitioning Palestine and creating a Jewish state. Stalin's shift to support Zionism was vital. One could say that Israel might not exist in its current form had the Soviet Union not offered its backing. Historians suspect that Stalin had hoped to weaken the position of the British imperialism in the region. Perhaps he saw the Jewish colonists as a kind of national liberation movement. But in reality, the prediction of all serious Marxists came true. The new Jewish state became a gendarme for imperialism. Soviet support for Israel was not limited to diplomatic means either. Via Czechoslovakia, the Soviet bloc sent arms to the Zionist militia Haganah, which used them to begin the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. In other words, Stalin gave material support for the Nakba, the Soviet-aligned Communist Party, the MAKI, became an important conduit of support for establishing the Zionist state. And we can see the false dichotomy here as always where the U.S. also supported the creation of Israel. And this article states, The U.S., which also supported the creation of Israel, officially banned weapon supplies to the Middle East. Unlike the Americans, however, Moscow sent arms to the Zionists. Though unofficially and through other countries such as Czechoslovakia, the USS used German weapons captured at the end of the war. After the collapse of the Soviet Union began what was called the 1990s post-Soviet Aliyah, which began in mass in the late 1980s when the government of Mikhail Gorbachev opened the borders of the Soviet Union and allowed Jews to leave the country for Israel. Between 1989 and 2006, about 1.6 million Soviet Jews and their non-Jewish spouses and their relatives, as defined by the law of return, emigrated from the former Soviet Union. About 979,000, or 61%, migrated to Israel. Another 325,000 migrated to the United States, and 219,000 migrated to Germany. According to the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, 26% of the immigrants who arrived in Israel were not considered Jewish by orthodox interpretations of Jewish law, which only recognizes matrilineal descent, but were eligible for Israeli citizenship under the law of return due to patrilineal Jewish descent or marriage to a Jew. 
These large numbers of people immigrating out of a communist state and into states such as Israel forever changed the politics of those nations. And despite that, in the nation they left, this grand plan for a Eurasian superstate still persists with Putin, as the article here reads. Back in 2012, when Putin was still the Prime Minister of Russia, he had a vision for a Soviet Union light. He hopes it will become a new Moscow-led global powerhouse. Then he claimed his planned Eurasian Union won't be grounded in ideology but on trade, much like the Belt and Road Initiative. Today, Ukraine has become central to Russia's expansionist ambitions. Russia's unilateral annexation of Crimea in 2015 and support for separatists in eastern Ukraine have ruptured its relations with the West, and Putin has intentionally recreated a Cold War atmosphere by touting Russia's conservative values as an ideological counterweight to the American-led liberal world order. In the mind of Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, the events leading to December 25th, 1991, when the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republic ceased to exist as a sovereign state, should not have happened. The collapse of the former USSR was gradual, but Putin feels Russia was taken advantage of its weakest point by the rest of Europe. Now he dreams of remaking the former Union, or at least something close to it. So it should come as no surprise that the Israelis are trying to play the fence in the situation. In one instance, they are fully on board with the Belt and Road Initiative, and in the other, they are the greatest American ally. But the <clears throat> proof shows that what they are actually doing is partaking completely in the Belt and Road Initiative, as you can see from this article. China's One Belt, One Road strategy, announced by Chinese President Xi Jinping at the end of 2013, aims to create infrastructure links and commercial routes between China and the Middle East, Europe and Africa via an overland belt and a maritime road. Within this framework, China perceives Israel as an excellent trade hub. The future Eilat railway line will serve as a land bridge linking the Red Sea from the port of Eilat to the Mediterranean Sea from the port of Ashdod, bypassing the Suez Canal. This new infrastructure will enable Israel to provide China with direct access to European, African, and Middle Eastern markets. We expect Israel's and China's partnership in all areas of infrastructure, ports, roads, cargo, railways, to continue to advance over the next 50 years. This partnership will play a vital role in improving Israel's geopolitical stability and securing China's commercial trade routes between the Far East, Europe, and Africa. China needs Israel to secure European, African, and Middle Eastern trade routes so that they can become the leading economic power. In return, Israel benefits greatly being the middleman in all of these transactions. So as you can see from the article, Xi Jinping invited Israel to take an active part in the GDI. The GDI is the Global Defense Initiative or the Global Development Initiative. It's the same thing as the Belt and Road Initiative, just a different fancy acronym for the exact same thing. However, Israel's interest is not to join the GDI or express blanket support for it, but rather to continue project by project cooperation with China on development while balancing economic, foreign policy, and security considerations. This GSI, which Israel is 100% for, in contrast, is intended to undermine US-led security frameworks. In the Middle East, it may jeopardize the progress of the Abraham Accords in the I2U2, a minilateral grouping launched in 2022 in compromise of Israel, the U.S., India, and the United Arab Emirates. Another article entitled, Engaging Israel in the Belt and Road Initiative, China's Techno-Nationalism in the Middle East. Excerpt from the book, the enormous growth of China's investments in Israel has become one of the major changes in the Middle East geopolitics during the last decade. This paper examines the nationalist motivation behind China's investment in Israeli technologies and Israel's strategic role in China's intended transition from the world factory to a global innovation champion. China's engagement with Israel in the Belt and Road Initiative reflects Chinese techno-nationalism. 
And this is all interesting because according to the Belt and Road Initiative, Israel is not a part of it, yet here they are being named as a part of it. Once again, another article about Israel and the economic growth that will happen from the Israeli-Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Even though, according to official sources, Israel is not a part of the BRI, uh, it would very much seem like they are. <laughs> though 4,000 miles away from each other, China and Israel, since establishing diplomatic relations in 1992, have seen bilateral cooperation develop and expanding to great mutual benefit. Especially in 2017, China and Israel announced the establishment of Innovative Comprehensive Partnership, which opened a new chapter of their friendly cooperation. From the Belt and Road cooperation to technology and innovation changes, over the years, China-Israel relations have achieved fruitful cooperation in various fields. The same article continues the read on, BRI promotes cooperation. Busily and efficiently, the new port in northern Israeli city of Haifa, a transportation and industrial center of the country, deals with tons of cargo every day. Inaugurated in September 2021, this port is expected to decrease import costs and present an economic boon for Israel, where most international trade is handled via maritime routes. The new port is an automated container port constructed primarily by the China Shanghai International Port Group, which was franchised to run the new port for 25 years. With 1.7 billion US dollar investment, the new port has an annual handling capacity of 1.86 million 20 foot equivalent units. The new port opened a new gateway to the world said Marav Michaeli, Israeli Transportation and Road Safety Minister, at the inauguration ceremony, adding that the new port will accelerate Israel's economic development, increase export and trade, bridge social gaps, and lower prices. Oddly not included here is how this cuts out America from all of this trade and hurts the United States. Indeed, even the U.S. sold arms to China in that period. Italy, the UK and especially France sold various arms as well. China was basically choosing which country to work with on which area of technology. But all those were large and powerful economies even back then. Compared to them, the Israeli economy of the 1980s was tiny. Yet for its economic size, Israel is alleged to have traded with China in defense deals way, way above its weight class back in the day. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, Israel concluded between two and three billion dollars worth of defense contracts with China during the 1980s. That figure was higher than the US arms sales and cooperation with China in the same period, not only in relative economy size comparison, but also in absolute nominal comparison. It was very low key initially. First large deals were signed from 1979 onward. A CIPRI study says over 60 defense technology deals were signed from 1979 until the year 2000. While the true extent of military deals will likely never be known, here are some of the more notable examples. China had fielded its first intermediate range ballistic missile, the DF-3, in 1971. But later variants needed a longer range. And with longer range, guidance was an issue, as precision suffered. Israeli firms allegedly were paid to assist in guidance technology transfer for said missile. The DF-15 is also sometimes cited to have benefited from some guidance technology assistance from Israel. That missile was tested from the late 1980s to mid-1990s, and some variants of it are still in use today. However, there is little tangible info on any of those technology transfers, except for a 1988 Washington Post article mentioning them. In the 1980s, after China was impressed with the performance of the Israeli Python 3 air-to-air -air missiles, it sought to buy both the missile and arrange technology transfer. It's one of the few well-documented technology deals. Some 3,000 missiles were assembled locally in China in a license deal. The Chinese copy, the PL-8, entered service from 1989 onward. The PL-8 was a huge step forward in infrared seeker technology for China and subsequent missiles benefited from that tech transfer a lot. The PL-9 missile, exported widely by China, basically mates the PL-8's body and internal components with PL-5's fin layout. 
It is also said Israeli firms had sold various night vision system technology as well as radio tech and electronic warfare and electronic signal measurement technology to China during the 1980s. As that clip from Azov Battalion's video is pointing out, the growing number of weapons that Israel is selling to the Chinese is a major concern to the international community. Here from the Arms Control Association, the United States has reportedly increased pressure on Israel about its arms sales to China, and Israel has given assurances that it will not export any item that could harm U.S. security, according to U.S. and Israeli officials in January. U.S. concerns about Israeli arms sales to China have existed for more than a decade and came to a head in July 2000 when the United States persuaded Israel to cancel the sale of the Falcon and advanced airborne early warning system to China. And you can see this growth of sales of weapons to the Chinese has been a problem for the United States for a long time. And despite China's assurances that this would stop, it hasn't. There were allegations over the years that avionics tech and specifically the heads-up display tech benefited from cooperation with Israeli firms. A US Senate report mentioned guided missiles technology as well. It suggested information related to US-made AIM-7 Sparrow radar guided missiles was handed over to China. Given that various NATO countries stopped weapons tech sales to China after 1989, Israel was basically the second biggest arms exporter to China in the 1990s, after Russia. Not to be left out of the international arms deals, the Israelis are also doing deals with the Russians. On September 6, 2010, Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin met with, at the time, Defense Minister Ehud Barak, and they inked a military agreement. As you can see here, Russia-Israel signed Military Cooperation Agreement, and this was on September 6, 2010, when Ehud Barak met with Vladimir Putin. The interesting part about this is alternative media would like you to think that Israel and Russia are enemies and are bombing each other in Syria. But that's not the case. They're making large cooperation agreements behind the scenes. If Israel was so concerned about Russia working with Iran, they would not be making deals such as this one they made. Ehud Barak said Israel was ready to continue sharing experience with the Russian military on fighting terrorism and ensuring security, including by using air drones. Barak also met with Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin, who said, We have purchased several unmanned aerial vehicles in Israel. We have launched a few satellites in Israel's interests. We are examining the possibility of equipping Israeli airplanes with our instruments and laser equipment. Does that sound like a country that is at war with Israel in places like Syria? Or do you think they're all working together on the rise of the multipolar world order? Back to the article, it says, Today's talks came after strains between Russia and Israel over Russian arms sales to Jewish states' major regional foes, Syria and Iran. And we will address that in a little bit as... Israel is very much behind Assad staying in power. Russia has sought to build up a fleet of Israeli-made spy drones since Georgia used Israeli aircraft against Russia in their brief 2008 war. Russian officials said Israel had already sold Moscow 12 pilotless aircraft and would supply 36 more worth around $100 million. So the Israelis have no problem providing arms, weapons, and technology to the Russians, and the Russians have no problem doing the same with the Israelis. Because they are all working together on the Belt and Road Initiative, and they are all a <clears throat> part of this new detente that's being created by the banksters. And just a quick reminder, the man who was negotiating these deals with Vladimir Putin, Ehud Barak, has been caught in the Jeffrey Epstein Israeli blackmail ring, as you can see here. Ehud Barak should also be famously known for referring Harvey Weinstein to the ex-Mossad agents known as Black Cube, 
which are an example of Mossad operatives operating inside the United States and harassing American citizens that are speaking out against people such as Ehud Barak and Harvey Weinstein. Just another example of Israeli infiltration and violation of American laws. So it comes as a shock and a surprise to some people that Israel is working both sides of the fence, but they are not. As you can see in this article here, did Israel warn Russia against judicial reform interference? And just showing that Israel has no problem asserting its dominance over nations that are much bigger with a much larger military because behind the scenes, the bankers are really running things in Israel, Russia, Iran, and China are all working together on massive billion upon billion dollar into the trillions of dollars infrastructure deals. So even at a time when US aid to Israel has never been higher and continues to grow, the Israelis continue to stab the Americans in the back and not only Americans, now they're also turning against Christians and making it a crime to worship Jesus in Israel. Conservative Christian leaders are calling on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to stop a bill proposed by members of his coalition to make it criminal to tell people about Jesus in Israel. Our Jerusalem correspondent Daniel Cohen is live near Tel Aviv with more. Good morning, Daniel. Good morning, Allison. Good morning, everyone. A big story just before our uh, days before Palm Sunday, Good Friday and Easter. Sacred time for Christians. Two ultra-Orthodox members of Prime Minister Netanyahu's coalition have introduced a bill that would punish believers for sharing the gospel of Jesus with prison time. United Torah Judaism Knesset members Moshe Gaffney and Yaakov Asher introduced legislation last week making it illegal to share in conversation or produce content online, in print, or by mail. Their explanation of the bill emphasizes a warning to stop Christians in particular. So I call these the Belt and Road Initiative Wars because if you were to take a map of the Belt and Road Initiative as we have here and overlay the recent wars, you can see a clear connection between the recent conflicts and the creation of this Belt and Road Initiative. Recent conflicts have included the Afghanistan war that went on for 20 years and the end result of that was the Chinese moving in and installing the Belt and Road Initiative, the Iraq War, the Syrian War, the Yemen War, the Ukraine War, and the recent coup in Nigeria. When you map all of these out, it becomes plainly obvious that what we're seeing is as was described in the 1984 war between Oceania and East Asia or Eurasia. One of the worries that people have with the Ukraine war and this Belt and Road Initiative war that's being fought through proxy wars at the moment is that these nuclear warning shots and these shots advance from simple proxy warfare to actual nuclear warfare. And if that were to take place, what would the simulation of that look like? And I find it interesting from the simulation that has been released that the nations of Israel and China are left mainly untouched in this nuclear confrontation between the United States and Russia as simulated here in this video.
If, uh, if Russia invades, uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again, then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. A few moments later. The leaks are under investigation. Um, their initial reports indicating that uh, this may be the result of an attack or some kind of sabotage, but these are initial reports and we haven't confirmed that yet. But if it is confirmed, that's clearly in, in no one's interest. Nord Stream pipeline was destroyed for many reasons. However, certainly one of them was the fact that Germans were continuing to fund the Russians openly by buying gas through the Nord Stream pipeline. So therefore, it was destroyed to put Germany back in line. Germany still has two US Air Force bases inside its borders, and they were basically told to get back in line by the United States. So because of the Ukraine war, the northern route of the Belt and Road Initiative train route has been shut down. However, this is forcing the Belt and Road Initiative members to go ahead and build a new middle route, which will further strengthen the Belt and Road Initiative as a whole when they rebuild Ukraine, which the bankers are already preparing to do. And you can tell the banksters are funding both sides and the countries involved in this proxy war in the Ukraine are not even trying to end it. As you can see, these countries are still funding Russia, as quoted here. Center for Research on Energy and Clean Air, which is based in Finland and funded through grants and research contracts, said the second biggest importer of Russia fossil fuels in the two months since the outbreak of the war was Italy. 6.9 billion euros, followed by China, 6.7 billion euros. South Korea, Japan, India, and the United States also purchased Russian energy after the start of the war, though significantly less than the European Union. As a whole, the 27 nation bloc accounted for 71% of Russia's total income from oil, gas, and coal, worth approximately 44 billion euros, the CREA report found said, thus proving the banksters are funding both sides of this and have the countries they're in control of buying oil and funding Russia as we are at the same time fighting Russia in a proxy war. So you can see the train route that got cut here is the one that goes from China through Russia to Germany. One of the proposed solutions to fix this is what they call the Middle Corridor Shipping Route, which avoids Russia, which means they do not have to then go down through Ukraine. The other proposed route to help facilitate trade is what they call the Northern Route, which is equivalent to the Northwest Passage, just on the Russian side of things, where traffic would travel maritime route off the north coast of Russia. Burr. Anyways. <clears throat> Thus the article reads, Putin has made developing the country's Arctic territories a national priority, in part to capitalize on the region's vast stores of oil, gas, coal, and other natural resources. As I said, Russia is there to provide the natural resources to the European Union and to the Chinese as part of the new Eurasian superstate. Continuing on with the article, the Northern Sea Route, the maritime zone that extends from the Kara Sea eastward to the Bering Strait is crucial for developing these territories, providing a way to ship resources out for export or to markets at more Southern latitudes in Europe and Asia. And the bankers were already fully on board with shutting down the Nord Stream 2, Ukraine war or not, as you can see here, Russia had already planned to shut down the Nord Stream 2 before the explosion took place. A Russian pipeline to China will replace the Nord Stream 2 gas link to Europe, abandoned amid the Ukraine conflict. Moscow's energy minister Alexander Novak said, Thursday. 
So the Nord Stream 2 was abandoned at the start of the Ukraine conflict and before it was destroyed. Asked in an interview with Russian television channel Russia 1 if Russia would replace the European Nord Stream 2 with the Asian Force Siberia 2, Novak said yes. Earlier in the day, the minister on the sideline of a visit to Uzbekistan said Russia and China would soon sign agreements on the delivery of 50 billion cubic meters of gas per year via the future Force 2 pipeline in Siberia. This volume will almost represent the maximum capacity of Nord Stream 1, 55 billion cubic meters in total, which has been shut down since September 2nd. A third of Russian gas supplies to the European Union had passed through the strategic pipeline which links Russia to Germany. Force Siberia 2 will fuel China's energy-guzzling economy, partly via Mongolia. Construction will start in 2024. It will therefore replace the Nord Stream 2 project, long backed by Germany, but which Washington viewed dimly, and which the West has scrapped since the Russian offensive in Ukraine began in late February. So in the end, the banksters, the Illuminati, Skull and Bones, got what they wanted out of the Nord Stream 2 being blown up, which was which was driving Russia and China closer together, closer than they even were before. As you can see here, Z to hand Putin another energy lifeline as China to buy even more Russian gas. So the Eurasian super state is being forced to being created. And thus the powers that should not be have their two puppet best friends further driving the two countries together for a global agenda to create a multipolar world order. A multipolar world order that can be used to drive the nations of the world into constant, never-ending proxy warfare, which is actually warfare against their own citizens as all of those weapons of war are eventually turned on the citizens themselves. I've got one that can see. So here we are, entering a new age of a new Cold War, which is much like the old Cold War. The new spy wars are the same as the old spy wars, just new players in the field. And the new weaponry used comes from various different technologies that have been developed over the years. And yes, do these intelligence agencies use these weapons and tactics against the foreign adversaries that the countries think they're being used against? Of course but they also eventually use it against their own citizens as well. And that is why even though these countries are seemingly at war with each other, Russia is at war with America and America is at war with China, yet the vast amount of surveillance these nations seem to be doing doesn't seem to be on each other's citizens, it seems to be on their own citizens. If you were to take a look at it from the outside, it would almost seem like the governments are at war with their own citizens and are surveilling them the way they would an enemy force. So much like in politics they've given you a fake left versus right, the bankers have now given you the Ukraine war with a fake pro-Russia versus anti-NATO stance for you to gobble up. The new mainstream media is alternative media and these alternative media voices have been given a script to make you fall for the new left versus right paradigm, the Eurasia versus NATO paradigm. NATO just admitted that they were warned that continued expansion would lead to Ukrainian invasion. They did it anyway. President Putin declared in the autumn of 2021, and he actually sent a, a draft treaty that he wanted NATO to sign to promise no more NATO enlargement. That was a precondition for not invade Ukraine. Of course, we didn't sign that. The opposite happened. So it seems that had they been willing to sign a treaty to not expand NATO, this war could have been avoided. Of course, the bankers were never going to let this war be avoided as they had too much money to make. And Russell Brand used to date a Rothschild family member, so getting the truth out of someone like that is very unlikely. 
you have to understand that these Bankster puppets are extremely well connected and go back a very long time. As you can see here, Henry Kissinger standing with Klaus Schwab. And you mentioned, uh, David, um, Henry Kissinger, and I think he first uh, was noticed by the Rockefeller family after he um, wrote a, um, a very erudite work on uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear war back in the late 1950s. Nuclear weapons and foreign policy. Right. Doing, yes. and it was then published, and uh, from that time on, he became uh, pretty close to the Rockefeller family. Well, he did. Um, actually, I guess I was the first one who got to know him because uh, he was a member of an organization called the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, and there was a, a study group at that time that he, as then a uh, young instructor at Harvard, uh, presided at. I was so impressed by him that uh, I introduced him to my brother Nelson, who was then governor in New York and was then considering uh, seeking the presidency of the United States. They became great friends and actually uh, Henry was, became Nelson's foreign policy advisor as long as he was in public life, and I think has, is one of the remarkable international statesmen in the world today. Even 30 years after he was Secretary of State, he is still asked by heads of state when he travels the world uh, for, their, for his advice. Let me go back to the time you said when you came here it transformed your life. Was there a course, a professor, who really made that difference for you? Yes, uh, there was um, one course, one seminar of um, Henry Kissinger, um, which really opened my eyes. I wasn't accepted to the seminar, but I sat in. I think he let me in because I was German. And, uh, and it was relatively shortly after the war, there were not too many Germans here. And uh, this created a friendship which has um, uh, endured until today. And uh, you know, uh, Henry has been several times in, in Davos. Um, and I think it was mainly uh, participating in his seminars that I developed my interest for geopolitical affairs. So when it comes to Russia, this Alexander Solzhenitsyn quote still applies to the modern day Russia. You must understand, the leading Bolsheviks who took over Russia were not Russians. They hated Russians. They hated Christians. Driven by ethnic hatred, they tortured and slaughtered millions of Russians without a shred of human remorse. It cannot be overstated. Bolshevism committed the greatest human slaughter of all time. The fact that most of the world is ignorant and uncaring about this enormous crime is proof that the global media is in the hands of the perpetrators. And that continues on till this day. The Bilderberger meetings are one of the meetings that the banksters run where people meet in secrecy and discuss how the world is going to be shaped. And Henry Kissinger has been one of the steering committee members of that for many, many years. One of the most influential people in the world. During these Bilderberg meetings, it is my hypothesis that large world events are concocted such as the Ukraine crisis. Here you can see they were openly discussing Ukraine, Russia, and NATO weighed heavy on the schedule with fiscal challenges and transnational threats, seeming like light relief. Today, said the head of NATO, Jen Stoltenberg, arriving in Lisbon to attend the talks, our security environment is more dangerous than it has been since the Cold War. And it is my opinion that these World movers are shaping these wars at these secretive meetings, which is why they don't want the press reporting on them. This article is about Henry Kissinger's involvement in another secretive group called the Bohemian Grove. And here you can see they are palling around with Russians, as it says, The Russian was the physicist Rold Sagdiv, a member of Soviet Supreme Council of People's Deputies who had given a speech to Kissinger and many other powerful men too. George Schultz, the former Secretary of State, wearing hiking boots, had listened while sitting under a tree. Kissinger had lolled on the ground, distributing mown grass clippings across his white shirt, being careful not to set his elbow on one of the cigar butts squashed in the grass, and joking with a wiry, nut-brown companion. 
The woman on the line now asks about the friend. Oh, Ricard is having a ball. Kissinger was sharing his turtleneck with Ricard. So you can see Kissinger highly connected to the Soviet Supreme Council and highly connected to longtime Putin confidant. Yes, that is right. Henry Kissinger was around and I believe helped the rise of Vladimir Putin from very little known KGB agent into the halls of power in Russia against other nationalists that he beat out. As Putin was not the number one nationalist that was some other general, Putin was the personal choice of one Henry Kissinger in the Bilderberg group. Article state, back in 1990s, Henry Kissinger, the legendary former US Secretary of State turned global consultant, encountered an intriguing young Russian and proceeded to ask him a litany of questions about his background. Quote, I worked in intelligence, Vladimir Putin finally told him, according to, quote, first person, a 2000 autobiography cobbled together from hours of interviews with then unfamiliar Russian leader, to which Kissinger replied, all decent people got their start in intelligence. I did too. As Putin climbed the ranks in the Kremlin, eventually becoming the autocratic president he is today, he and Kissinger kept up a warm report, even as the United States and Russia grew further apart. Kissinger is one of the few Americans to meet frequently with Putin, one former US ambassador recently recalled. Along with movie star Steven Seagal and ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson, the likely next Secretary of State. And as you can see here, throughout Putin's career, and from the very beginning, the inception of his career, Henry Kissinger has been there, pulling the strings. You know, says Igor Shadkan, as we sit in his office and discuss his longtime friend, Vladimir Putin, Henry Kissinger came here to St. Petersburg when Putin was a deputy mayor. Putin spoke to him in German. Vladimir Putin's Russia's acting president has a few unlikely friends. One of them is Igor Shadkan, a Jewish documentary film producer who says he was a quiet anti-Soviet dissident in his day. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? It would seem that Vladimir Putin is the personal choice of the Bilderberg Group, the Bohemian Grove, and the World Economic Forum types. You can use the Fossi Dust Revolution to create, um, let's say, fast track growth for your country. My commitment will be to add value, will be part of the young leaders yes, initiative. This is Merkel, Tony Blair, um, they were all, even uh, President Putin. They were all young global leaders before. Mm. So um, if I take you, if I take Chancellor Kurz and the New Zealand mm. Prime Minister, the three youngest leaders of governments are here. When I say banksters, I truly mean the banksters are behind both sides of the multipolar world order. BlackRock has huge investments in the United States and everyone knows how, quote, BlackRock runs the world. However, what they have not shown you is the fact that BlackRock is also heavily investing in the Chinese. BlackRock has five funds with more than $429 million invested in Chinese companies acting against U.S. interests. BlackRock sees the Belt and Road Initiative as one of the five megatrends emerging for global wealth, and BlackRock has been investing heavily into Chinese infrastructure. In fact, BlackRock and these other large asset fund managers have become so blatant about their funding of the Chinese against U.S. interests it has forced the U.S. Congress to actually do something, which to get Congress to make any sort of act against banksters is basically an act of God, a small miracle, which shows you how badly the banksters are messing up. Here, BlackRock, MSCI Inc., and other firms are bracing for tighter oversight following a congressional probe over investments in Chinese companies 
deemed to be a national security threat and an executive order curtailing specific investments there. More than 2,000 U.S. mutual and exchange traded funds, particularly those tracked indexes, have 294 billion invested across Chinese stocks and bonds, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. Though not all of that money is invested in companies facing lawmaker scrutiny, Vanguard Group, BlackRock, Fidelity Investments, and DWS Group manage funded with investments in China, some of which are the type that Congress is investigating. And that's because these large banksters are funding the rise of the Chinese military and they're funding Chinese companies that are a direct national security threat to the United States and to Western nations, thus proving these large bankers are behind both sides of the multipolar world order and this fake war they are creating. Even the puppet Biden administration is against this. The, Biden, the same Biden administration that handed Afghanistan to the Chinese and the Taliban. The Biden administration last Wednesday signed executive order limiting U.S. investments in China and in key technology industries. Separately on July 31st, House Select Committee on Chinese Communist Party alleged BlackRock funds are investing in Chinese companies acting against U.S. interests, demanding the asset manager hand over documents about the inclusion of Chinese firms in its funds. The ties between the two countries' businesses haven't frayed as much as a lot in Washington would like, Martin Korzempa, senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, said in a phone interview. Certain lawmakers would like to push for more of a decoupling. Gallagher and his committee have homed in on BlackRock, the world's largest money manager, and MSCI, one of the country's biggest index providers. The Select Committee on China alleges BlackRock has five funds with more than 429 million invested in Chinese companies acting against the United States. The funds have investments in 20 companies tied to one or more of the government's watch lists, according to the committee. The Defense Department keeps a list of identifying Chinese military companies while the Department of Homeland Security tracks Chinese companies that use forced labor. A third list managed by U.S. Treasury restricts the purchase or sale of securities in certain Chinese military industrial companies while also allowing money managers and U.S. investors to maintain current holdings in those firms. The Treasury Department says the list doesn't apply to all of the company's subsidiaries or related entities, thus once again proving Western large money managers are investing in the Chinese military. This is similar to the Cold War where Western money was flowing into the Soviet Union and propping it up to create this fake enemy. And despite what James Corbett told you, it's not BlackRock that runs the world, it is the bankers who run the world. There are many other asset managers besides BlackRock involved, such as Vanguard. The 73 billion Vanguard FTSE Emerging Markets ETF, for example, has almost a third of its assets allocated to China and has shares of CGN Power Company LTD, an Inspur Electronic Information Industry company. According to Bloomberg, Bloomberg data, as of July 31st, these two specific entities aren't on the Treasury list. China Nuclear Power Corporation, which Treasury says is a known CGN, and Inspur Group Company LTD do appear on the list. DWS Group's 2.2 billion X-Trackers Harvest CSI 300 China A Shares ETF has about 8 million in shares of China CSSC Holdings LTD. According to Bloomberg data, that entity isn't on the Treasury list, while China State Shipbuilding Corporation, which Treasury says is known as CSSC, is on the list. And thus you can see they're playing games with various shell companies that have the same name or close to it as the company that they're investing in. So it's this way to allow these large banking corporations and entities to invest in the Chinese military and help them build everything, including the Chinese Navy. As you can see here, they're investing in the China State Shipbuilding Corporation. So these banksters that are funding both sides of this war have created the new Belt and Road Wars 
And why do I call them the Belt and Road Wars? Because they are. Here you have one example of this, which is Yemen. Yemen's warring parties talk as 12 million suffer from severe hunger. And this war is a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the same Saudi Arabia and Iran that are working together on the Belt and Road Initiative. And Yemen has recently joined the Belt and Road Initiative, which then led to this conflict. And this is a theme that you can see happening around the world. If you just type in the name of any conflict that is currently going on, and then Belt and Road, such as Yemen Belt and Road Initiative, you will find that the country that's in turmoil has recently entered into the BRI. As you can see here, the Belt and Road Initiative, new driving force for Sino-Yemen relationship. And what's going on at the same time? Yemen is in a war that is leaving its population starving to death. Another blatantly obvious example of this, which also fits in the Greater Israeli Project, is Syria, which has also recently joined the Belt and Road Initiative. And as we all know, Syria for years has been in warfare. The basic way this works is, the United States and the Western powers destroy a country such as Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and then the Chinese and the Russians move in to build it back up after it's been destroyed. Just prior to the Ukraine war, Ukraine was installing all types of infrastructure for the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and had joined the BRI as one of the key countries in the BRI. So it should be no surprise that we now find Ukraine in the midst of a major war. As this article reads, Belt and Road. Ukraine is an important hub within the Belt and Road Initiative, Chinese President Xi Jinping's signature infrastructure and foreign policy project, which Kiev joined in 2017. In 2020, the two sides signed an agreement to strengthen cooperation in areas, including the financing and construction of infrastructure projects. Big Chinese companies with operations in Ukraine include state food conglomerate, Kofco Group, state-run builders, China Pacific Construction Group, and China Harbor Engineering Company, and telecoms gear giant Huawei Technologies. Direct investment by Chinese firms in Ukraine totaled 150 million by end 2019, according to Chinese data. In the first three quarters of 2020, Chinese firms invested 75 million on projects in Ukraine, according to Ukraine's embassy in China. Kafko in 2016 launched a grain terminal at Nikolev Seaport worth 75 million in southern Ukraine. CHEC completed dredging project at the port of Chernomorsk. If I said that incorrectly, I'm sorry. China Pacific Construction Group in 2017 signed a deal to build a metro line in the capital Kiev and Huawei, which has helped Ukraine develop its mobile networks in 2019, won the bid to install 4G network in Kiev subway. And now you're wondering what happened to all that lovely infrastructure during the Ukraine war. Well, it got completely destroyed and now will have to be rebuilt with loans from the same bankers that fund both sides of this conflict and loan money to all the governments to blow up Ukraine in the first place. They will also loan money to Ukraine to rebuild it as part of China's Belt and Road Initiative as soon as this war is over and as they have done in every other country that has been in turmoil recently. Iraq has become a part of the Belt and Road Initiative, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, every one of these countries that's in warfare ends up being become rebuilt by the Belt and Road Initiative and managed by the Chinese or Russians. Did you see this contract? The rebuilding of Ukraine, $400 billion contract. BlackRock and Chase is helping rebuild Ukraine. And then, you know, okay, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but what the hell is going on here? According to the book 1984, one of the main battlegrounds between Oceania and Eurasia is Africa. And as you can see, the Belt and Road Initiative is making its way into the African continent. With his involvement in the infrastructure sector beginning in the 1960s, China has established an active presence across the African continent. Trade between China and Africa has surged drastically from US 1 billion in 1980 to 128 billion by 2016. Since 2000 has provided cumulative loans of US 143 billion in Africa, with half of them given over the last four years alone making it Africa's largest bilateral creditor. 
At the 2018 Forum for China-African Cooperation in Beijing, China offered Africa US $60 billion for development financing until 2021. China has made significant inroads into Africa under the Belt and Road Initiative. At the bilateral level, it has invested in 52 out of the 54 African countries and is poised to enter the 53rd market in Sao Tome and Principe. Out of the entire African continent, there are only five countries, Eritrea, Benin, Mali, Sao Tome and Principe, and Eza Watani, Swaziland, that have neither signed an MOU nor expressed support. However, China is making huge inroads into all these other countries, and even those five included. <clears throat> Benin's president has asked local firm Petrolin and French giant Bellor to withdraw from a major rail infrastructure project linking Benin to Niger to make way for China. And Niger is one of the major countries that's part of the new railway project for the Belt and Road Initiative in China. And as we've seen recently, what has happened in Niger recently? What we're seeing here is more of the same chaos and tragedy that ensues after the Belt and Road Initiative makes its way into a new country. Another flashpoint that is brewing is in the Caribbean. China's engagement in the Caribbean and the United States response has not been good. A genuine feeling of economic and political neglect permeating through the Caribbean has allowed China to take advantage of the economic vacuum created by US-led economic model that relies on globalized supply chains. China is now one of the largest trading partners of many Caribbean countries, and it finances infrastructure projects across the region as part of its Belt and Road Initiative, and you can see how the chart has changed over time. So far, Antigua, Barbuda, Barbados, Cuba, Dominica, Dominican Republic, Grenada, Guyana, Jamaica, Suriname, and Trinidad and Tobago have all signed Memorandum of Understandings to be a part of the Belt and Road Initiative. The most prominent of these major infrastructure projects is the creation of ports, but they also range from bridges, highways, airports, and more. And as we know, the Chinese ports are all dual service military infrastructure. So the media and alt media loves to cite how the United States has military bases around the world and the United States is occupying the entire planet. What they don't ever mention is the Chinese through the militarized Belt and Road Initiative have done the exact same thing, possibly even more countries involved. As you can see here from this mapping out of the Belt and Road Initiative and the nations that have signed MOUs with the Chinese, they are slowly and surely building the Eurasian superstate and encircling every country around North America. Yet somehow alternative media and mainstream media never shows you a map of how widespread Chinese influence and their military has spread under the Belt and Road Initiative. One of the largest hotspots that is clearly being set on the world stage is Taiwan, as Taiwan is extremely important for this establishment of the Eurasian superstate under the Belt and Road Initiative. The Chinese need Taiwan in order to secure the maritime route, and also they need Taiwan for their semiconductor manufacturing capacity to build the new smart city projects for the Belt and Road Initiative and for the military equipment as part of the modernized Chinese and Russian militaries. The CCP have been doing a lot of saber rattling regarding Taiwan and have even released this video showing what would happen if Taiwan was attacked. The Chinese have become so brazen in their threats against the Taiwanese that they're now even willing to violate international law, China stating it will start boarding Taiwan ships in the Taiwan Strait, which is international waters. Recently, Chinese troops have been stating that they are willing to die for Taiwan, 
an increasing hostility towards the island nation. Amidst ever-increasing air sorties into Taiwan airspace, China has sent 68 warplanes and 10 Navy vessels around Taiwan in 24 hours on September 14, 2023, just weeks after the first ever U.S. transfer of military equipment to the island nation of Taiwan. Another act of aggression by the Chinese in the region is they are teaming up with the Russians and increasing their encircling patrols of the Japanese islands, provoking Japan further and further. One of the interesting things the Chinese are doing is building special target ranges to practice striking ballistic missiles against facilities such as Guam, Taiwan, and also ships by putting carrier and destroyer sized targets on railways and practicing ballistic missile strikes against those as you can see from satellite imagery. It is interesting that Mr. Man of the People, Elon Musk, is going to spout the same political rhetoric about Taiwan that Henry Kissinger set into place back in 1971. You know, the, the fundamental thing here is, is really Taiwan. Um, the, the, China has, well, really since uh, for, for like half a century or so, uh, maybe longer at this point, maybe longer at this point, the, the, their, their policy has been to, to um, sort of re reunite Taiwan with China. Of course, the current state of affairs in Taiwan goes all the way back to a meeting that Henry Kissinger had secretly in China in the year 1971. In his talk with Zhu on July 9th, Kissinger did not use Zhao's formulation that Taiwan was a part of China, but he nevertheless acknowledged it when he declared that we are not advocating a two China solution or a one China, one Taiwan solution Kissinger declaration prompted Zhu to say we had not yet said that he was optimistic about Sino-American rapprochement. So as you can see, this deal, this Taiwan-US-China deal goes back to this meeting in the 70s that Kissinger put into place and is soon going to likely lead to war over the Taiwanese island. Of course, Elon Musk also falls into the role of building the great cyber kingdom of Israel that we're going to get into in a second. As you can see here, X, Twitter, to hand over user data to Israeli firm in disastrous new verification process. A10 Tix is a subsidiary of ICTS founded by former agents of Israel's Shin Bet General Security Service. X, formerly known as Twitter, will soon require its XBlue subscribers to submit biometric data, including a selfie and a government-issued ID, to Israeli company AU10TIX as part of the verification process. It's not just Trump that is connected to Chabad Lubavitch. Chabad Rabbi Beryl Lazar is the chief rabbi of Russia. He is very close to President Vladimir Putin. The Jewish oligarchs at Putin's side are also the main financiers of Chabad Lubavitch. Jews control the wealth of Russia, and Chabad is a dominant force. They're not going anywhere. If this offends you, know that there are Russians who agree with me. Chabad can say whatever they want about Gentiles. Meanwhile, Putin is making it illegal to criticize them. A taxi driver in Russia was sentenced to 350 hours of community service for writing online that Jews dominate Russia and the world. Imagine what would happen if we were in Russia. Putin passed a law sentencing Holocaust deniers to five years in prison. Russia is virtually free of anti-Semitism. Putin is calling for Jews to emigrate to Russia. Jews destroy your country. Why would Putin be welcoming them into Russia? That's because they're not a threat. They've already destroyed Russia with Marxism and took it over 100 years ago. It's the West which they are currently destroying with cultural Marxism so that they can take it over. 
As Putin's rabbi Beryl Lazar puts it, the West lacks mutual respect, unlike Russia. Putin was Israel's person of the year in 2015, despite working with Syria and Iran. Reuven Rivlin, the president of Israel, says that Putin is loyal to Israel's security. If you read the comments on RT's videos, you might actually believe that Putin is against Israel. But Putin's rabbi, Beryl Lazar, says that ties with Israel have never been closer. Israel has a simple message. We don't put all our eggs in one basket. We don't rely only on America. So Russia, China, Israel, all working together on the benefit of the banksters. And this Belt and Road is driving this aggression towards Taiwan from Beijing because they need Taiwan for the Belt and Road Initiative maritime route. They also need Taiwan because Taiwan is home to more than 90% of the manufacturing capacity for the world's most advanced semiconductors. So if the world powers are going to rebuild the world order over into a smart city gulag with cities such as Dubai, Astana, and the other smart cities that are on the Belt and Road Initiative route already, they're going to need the manufacturing capacity to do that. And that's why Taiwan is one of the new primary targets in the Belt and Road Initiative Wars. It's not just the Chinese that need Taiwan's manufacturing capability. The Russians, who the Chinese are doing war drills with constantly, also need the microchips from Taiwan for their military as well. The chips in China are already being used, as you can see in this video, to create a social credit system where things such as what you're seeing is China's electric vehicle owners must give out their identification to authorities and get their faces scanned or they can't use navigation and listen to auto music and much more. If you're being blacklisted by the social credit system, you will be locked out of your vehicle. Welcome to the new world order. But don't you worry, you can always donate blood to raise your social credit score. If data is the new oil, then the world's fiber optic cables are the world's new oil pipelines. If we look at where these various fiber optic cables run, we can see the formation of the Eurasian superstate once again and having Israel at the center of this entire cyber kingdom. China is dubbing this part of the plan the Digital Silk Road. <clears throat> the Digital Silk Road will also allow Beijing to shape the current and future use of the new 5G technology. Two of the world's largest telecommunication companies, Zhongjing and Huawei, currently control an estimated 40% of the 5G global marketplace with the latter being the largest 5G supplier on all continents apart from North America. Both companies have developed global telecom and infrastructure partnerships in other countries, including Iran, where 90% of the population is connected to the internet. So as you can see, outside of North America, the Chinese are building one digital Silk Road for all of Eurasia. So if we map out who benefits from the Chinese creating a digital Silk Road, it has to be Israel. And Israel not only took over the digital world, they created it. They don't call it a net because it's not a trap. For instance, the Intel 8088, this microprocessor designed at Intel's Haifa laboratory, powered the first personal computer that IBM built which is credited with kickstarting the PC revolution. The 8088 was designed in Israel at Intel's Haifa laboratory, and all of Intel is core coded and designed in Israel, meaning the Israelis have had a back door into all Intel hardware since its inception. Some more of the myriad of things that were created in Israel include the network firewall, which is the technology to block malware, filter malicious traffic and prevent unauthorized access to a network. 
also invented in Israel, the first instant messaging service, originally developed by the Israeli company Mirabilis. Also, Face ID, the Apple Inc. facial recognition software used in iPhone devices. Also, Windows XP and Windows NT. Much of these operating systems were developed at the Microsoft Israel campus. Even though most people think of Microsoft as an American company and Apple as an American company, they have backdoor access in Israel to all of these companies' technologies. I continue on. Development and production of processors and chipsets for many companies including Google, Apple, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, Amazon, IBM, Broadcom, ARM, STM Microelectronics, Samsung, Sony, and Qualcomm. Some who've had major research and development centers in Israel for decades often developing key technologies in their Israeli R&D centers. Basically everything Microsoft is compromised as Bill Gates has been to Epstein Island about a billion times. Microsoft Security Essentials developed in Israel. Microsoft Connect developed in Israel for the Xbox gaming system stuff. Babylon also developed in Israel. Basically, everything on the internet was developed in Israel and has backdoor access for the Israeli government. So when we take a look at the submarine cable fiber optic network that exists around the world, we can see there is one major choke point between east and west, one center point right smack in the middle of Eurasia that will facilitate all of the internet traffic right through it. As we can see here, all of the cables, the underwater fiber optic cables that come in from the east, from Asia, run up the Red Sea, right through the Suez Canal, and out into Europe. Some of them currently run up through Israel and out into Europe. And this is the world with it as it currently is. However, if we are to consider the greater Israeli project, and the future world that we'll be living in, it would actually show you that all of these fiber optic cables will run through greater Israel in the future. This will turn Israel into the center of trade and technology and information in the entire Eurasian superstate. To build this new Israeli cyber kingdom, they have been signing and doing extremely large deals with very little media coverage, such as this one. Israel will be a central hub of Citurian's Trans-Europe Asia system. A project by Centurion Corp for laying an intercontinental fiber optic network at a total investment of some $900 million. The fund has bought 25% of the project for developing an advanced fiber optic network extending 20,000 kilometers that will open an internet channel connecting India, the Middle East, and Europe. Israel, which is a central crossroads in the project, will be connected via the advanced network both eastward and westwards. As I'm showing you, Israel is being set up as the new center of the internet for all of Eurasia. Another example of this is a Israeli fiber optic cable project with Google called the Blue Raman Cable. This is a, another fiber optic cable that costs roughly $400 million and goes thousands and thousands of kilometers across the planet, connecting India to Italy through many countries, including Israel. And there's another example of how these countries are willing to do these deals together while seemingly at war with each other in the public eye. As shown earlier, the underwater fiber optic cables make a hub in Egypt near the Sinai Peninsula. And until the Greater Israel Project takes those lands from Egypt, currently they are in Egypt now, making Egypt a internet cable hub of the world. However, the Israelis are not going to wait until they take that territory. As you can see here, Google intends to build a new corridor for internet traffic via fiber optic network for the first time between Israel and Saudi Arabia, linking Asia to Europe 
which is seen as a threat to Egypt's future as a major transit point for international submarine cables. Thus, whether Israel takes over the land where these fiber optic cables go now for the Greater Israel Project, or they just build a new internet hub that goes through Israel itself. Both ways, they get what they want out of this, which is Israel controlling the internet. This makes Israel very powerful. This makes Israel very powerful. This makes Israel very powerful. It's giving us powers and prowess that we never had before. It's giving us powers and prowess that we never had before. But we are in a position now to compensate beyond anything that we dreamed of. But we are in a position now to compensate beyond anything that we dreamed of. And the future belongs to those who can seize this change. And the future belongs to those who can seize this change. We are positioned right at the cusp of this change, right at the center of this change. We are positioned right at the cusp of this change, right at the center of this change. We can take it, and we are. It's changing us. We can take it, and we are. It's changing us. And cyber, and cyber is a real domain of power. That clip was from Brendan O'Connell, who's been one of the forefront runners of this research, getting it out there to people like myself. And as you can see here, it's very important as cyber is a true weapon of power in the modern world. And here you can see Israel has backdoor access into things such as NVIDIA chips. Chip giants NVIDIA R&D activities in Israel are already the firm's largest outside the U.S., the company currently employs about 3,000 people across seven centers nationwide, and they're looking to expand their operations with another 1,000 engineers putting backdoor access into all NVIDIA chips for the state of Israel. Microsoft's main R&D centers for its operating systems are in the Microsoft Israel offices. Collectively, the offices host a wide variety of software, hardware development domains, including cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and business intelligence, alongside sales and marketing. So as you can see here, these are the R&D development centers for the operating systems for Microsoft. And you have to wonder if Israel is giving access to this type of stuff to the Chinese and the Russians. See here from their own website, Microsoft Israel Development Center is one of Microsoft's most strategic global centers that develops life-changing, world-shifting products right here in Israel. We're a diverse group of incredibly talented individuals who work together to bring ideas to life that impact billions. Microsoft's mission to empower every organization on the planet to achieve more. This would include all of the U.S. government operating systems. Go to their website and we can see, Welcome to Microsoft Israel R&D Center. So you can see right here in their very own website, they're advertising that their R&D Center is in Israel. The center is made up of 30 product development teams and numerous high-impact domains such as cybersecurity, business analytics, and artificial intelligence also including security, digital transformation platforms, experiences and devices, cloud AI platform, and research. So is it any surprise when so many Russian hackers are accessing various systems and Chinese hackers are breaking into Microsoft systems when Israel is working with Russia and China on the Belt and Road? And here we can see Microsoft says Israeli company is behind malware that affected Windows PCs. Do we not see what is going on here? Which brings to mind a recent hacking of Microsoft operating systems and Microsoft 365 email. US State Department hacked by China. Approximately 60,000 emails were stolen from the State Department. They also hacked the email accounts of around 25 other organizations, including government agencies. 10 US State Department email addresses were hacked which nine of them belong to individuals deep in East Asia and Pacific affairs. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo was among the individuals impacted. Hackers forged digital authentication tokens required by the system. Tokens are typically used to verify a person's identity. 
China labeled the accusation disinformation and called the U.S. government the world's biggest hacking empire and global cyber thief. Experts say this is one of the largest known cyber espionage campaigns against the United States. The hack was uncovered by Microsoft and occurred around May of this year. Of course, Microsoft. Very honored uh, to have this chance to meet. Uh, and we've always had great conversations and uh, we'll have a, a lot of important topics uh, to discuss today. I was very disappointed I couldn't come uh, during these last four years. Uh, and so it's very exciting to be back. Now that was Bill Gates, less than a month ago, visiting his good pal Xi Jinping. Another absolutely insane thing that recently took place is Apple fixed a zero-day bug used to plant what's known as Pegasus spyware, which is Israeli spyware that comes all the way back from the days of Robert Maxwell and Promise Software in the Epstein ring. Also known as the Inslaw case, for more on this and the death of Danny Casolaro, go see my documentary, the Clinton Body Count documentary, or go see more about this group in the Pie Fence documentary, The Syndicate. Pegasus Spyware is developed by Israeli cyber arms company, NSO Group, which Brendan O'Connell has done an excellent playlist on that is designed to be covertly and remotely installed on mobile phones running iOS and Android. While NSO Group markets Pegasus as a product for fighting crime and terrorism, governments around the world have routinely used the spyware to surveil journalists, lawyers, political dissidents, and human rights activists. Pegasus operators were able to remotely install spyware on iOS versions through 16.03, using zero-click exploit. While the capabilities of Pegasus may vary over time due to software updates, Pegasus is generally capable of reading text messages, call snooping, collecting passwords, location tracking, accessing the target's device's microphone and camera, and harvesting information from applications. The spyware is named after Pegasus, the winged horse of Greek mythology. Intel Inside, of course, is putting its most advanced, in fact, the world's, quote, smartest building in the world in America, right? Right in Silicon Valley? Nope. They're putting it in Israel. Israel's PTK1 creates 50 terabytes of data daily. Intel unveiled its newly highly efficient development center in Patak, Tikva, Israel. The 800,000 square foot, 11 story building named PTK1 unites 2,000 employees who have been scattered in eight buildings across five campuses. Intel's new development center is the smartest one around. PTK1 independently runs its various systems and functions, accumulating data, processing it, and using artificial intelligence to make decisions. Meanwhile, Intel Inside chips are running everything, including the F-35s on U.S. soil that's now having worldwide implications. The Marine Corps has now issued a two-day pause in operations for all aircraft to discuss safety. That's more than a 1,000 planes and helicopters all across the globe. It comes after that lost fighter jet was finally found. It was missing for more than 24 hours. On Sunday, a pilot of the F-35 ejected from the cockpit over South Carolina. The pilot landed safely, but the $100 million plane could not be found. Yeah, last night, a debris field was discovered in rural South Carolina, where the jet apparently crashed, according to the military. It was found about two hours northeast from Joint Base Charleston. Someone who lives nearby says he thinks he heard it. And I heard a, a screeching, saw that between a screech and a whistle. So according to the mainstream reports, what happened is the pilot ejected out of a $100 million F-35 jet that, quote, went missing due to bad weather. One of the most advanced fighter jets in the world crashed because of bad weather. They must think we're dumb. 
quote, he's unsure of where his plane crashed, said he just lost it in the weather, unquote, said someone on Charleston County and medical emergency services while they relaying what the pilot allegedly said as reported to the New York Post. Completely not believable story. So unfortunately, I have a different theory on what happened, starting with this tweet here by Brian Larkin at Kilobit. I just want to state for the record, I've been warning the U.S. government about a potential leak of the Integrity 178B operating system through South America for literally over a year and a half now. Guess what operating system powers the F-35? Wait for it, wait for it, Integrity 178B. I told you so at NSA Cyber. So what company is responsible for Integrity 178B control system of the F-35? Green Hill Software, which has offices all over the world, not just in the United States, and uses Intel inside and AMD chips, which are all made in Israel, for the hardware of the operating system. So not only is the operating system itself designed in Israel, the chips that it uses are also designed in Israel. Thus, there's always been a back door into the F-35 operating system. This Integrity 178B gives the Israelis access to the control systems, the operating systems of the following military aircraft, the B-2 bomber, the F-16, the F-22, the F-35, the commercial Airbus A380. This is massive access into extremely important national security platforms of the United States military. You see, that's integrity. Those other guys, no integrity. Do you want some fucking integrity? I'm gonna have an operating system for my F-35. It better give some integrity, some real integrity. The Integrity Architecture Support Package, ASP, provides support for many processor families, including PowerPC Power ISA, AMD and Intel x86, ARM Holdings, ARM, MIPS, Basically, every chipset that's core coded and designed in Israel turns out. It's not like that's giving backdoor access to a country that's working with the Russians and the Chinese to all of our top military hardware and our best military aircraft. I wonder how bad that could possibly go. 70 bogeys in your sector, please verify. <laughs> Very funny station. That's a big negative, over. Yeah, might be a glitch in one of the ACS modules. San Bravo, be advised, running diagnostics to scan for malfunction. The skies are clear, Station. You've got yourself some phantom dots. Over. Zulu X-Ray 6, signs in your sector of some 100 bogeys. Please advise. Negatory, Station. Scope is clear. I don't know what to tell you. Solar interference, heavy sunspot activity today. Sierra Delta, uh, we may have a minor ACS fault here. Do you have anything on your scope? Sierra Delta, repeat. I'm looking at fighter jets over I-95! How the hell did they get through? Stand by, attempting to contact the nearest unit in that sector. I read you. This is 1st Battalion, 75th Ranger Regiment. Sergeant Foley, acting commander of Hunter 21. Do you copy? Over. All stations be advised. Satellite surveillance has been disabled. SOSUS and PAYPOS arrays are inoperative at this time. And that's why you don't let companies that have offices outside the United States have access to something as critical as the operating systems on the F-35s and the F-22s and the B-2 bombers and probably the satellite systems and every other piece of electronic military equipment the U.S. is relying on to protect itself. These companies like Green Hill Software are privately owned companies, which is fine, but they should be limited to having offices in the United States and not having their R&D and development offices in foreign countries, which opens them up to foreign infiltration. And the Israelis are trying to play both sides of the fence when it comes to intelligence, while remaining a part of the Five Eyes Alliance, literally being one of the major players in that, 
which gives them access to U.S. intelligence. They are also teaming up with new partners to establish new intelligence ties. Much as Henry Kissinger described shifting to the east, the Israeli intelligence services have shifted their alliances to the east as well. Quote, he said that Israel already has extensive ties with five eyed nations, including what he dubbed as an incredibly close intelligence sharing and security partnership with our closest ally, the United States. But he added that Israel would look to deepen the relationships. We're focusing on continuing to deepen these ties through their existing frameworks and agreements. We would consider any other options for expanding these ties should they present themselves, he said. These statements, if anything, are an obvious signal from Israel that is ready to enhance these capacities in cooperation with Australia and later with other countries in the Indo-Pacific as well. After the AUK-US agreement, this is a development that could put a final death knell into the Five Eyes Alliance, and it talks about how the Israelis are teaming up with Jacinda Ardern of New Zealand, even though she's come out with a very pro-CCP stance. So now that the Israelis have created their cyber kingdom with backdoor access into everything and having been the core coding design team on all of this hardware and operating systems, they have countries like China implementing these devices to run their society. China uses AI, artificial intelligence, to run courts, supreme justices, cutting judges, typical workload by more than a third and saving a billion work hours. That's right, China's court system is now run by artificial intelligence that is basically core coded and designed in Israel. If you wanted your no hide courts, here they are. <laughs> the Chinese are implementing them themselves. And what does our horrific smart city world look like? Well, here is a AI rendition of what the future smart city AI run world will look like. Very scary and disturbing stuff, if you ask me. Let go of decisions and let the carnival choose each thrill for you. Simply sit back and soak in fun. Getting hungry? Make your way to Brightside Bistro. Of course, when they're trying to sell you this future world and smart city gulag that you will be living in, it doesn't look like that artificial intelligence rendition. It looks like this green, nature-connected, beautiful city like Neom that just so happens to be on the Belt and Road Initiative and is one of the cities that they're building up to make the Belt and Road Initiative look like a good plan for the future. And they're building cities like this Neom to make the smart city gulags look like they're gonna be wonderful places that we'll all wanna be in. When we all know they're gonna look more like that AI creepy rendition that we just saw. Of course, the entire Belt and Road Initiative plan falls into the greater plan for a greater Israel as the entire Belt and Road Initiative would make Israel the center of trade and technology in the world. Greater Israel is most commonly referred to as the land encompassed by the term is the territory of the state of Israel, together with the Palestinian territories. An earlier definition favored by revisionist Zionists included the territory of the former Emirate of Transjordan. Basically, when you're looking at what they're trying to take back, it comes from this definition from the Bible, which states the territory is from the Brook of Egypt to the Euphrates, which is a much larger piece of land than what Israel currently occupies, though they are very slowly expanding their borders. You cannot discuss the plan for a greater Israel without also discussing the Odin Yunnan plan. A lot of people believe that this plan has been what has shaped the Middle East over the past few years, starting with the Iraq war. To summarize the plan, it is basically to cause sectarian violence in all of the Arab nations that surround Israel in order for Israel to strengthen itself against them. It also talks about, quote, the rationalist and humanist foundations of Western civilizations are in a state of collapse. The West was disintegrating before the onslaught of the Soviet Union and the Third World, 
a phenomenon Yonin believed would is accompanied by an upsurge in anti-Semitism, all of which meant that Israel would become the last safe haven for Jews to seek refuge in. So this is about this driving up anti-Semitism in the West in order for the Western nation Jews to go back to Israel to drive up the immigration in Israel. Odin Yanan also wanted to flood the Western world to destroy it with immigrants from the Third World in order to help further drive this plan into action. That's why when people see Europe and America being flooded by immigrants, they blame the Odin Yanan plan as he wrote this was the plan. Also, when you see the blueprint it laid out for the Middle East, it would seem that these plans of Odin Yunnan have been taking place regardless if this was the actual plan for the Middle East or not. <clears throat> and one of the things that the Odin Yunnan plan calls for is for Egypt to return the Sinai Peninsula to Israel. And if you remember earlier, when looking at the Kingdom of Israel cyber, you know, dominance and where the fiber optic cable lines run they go right through the sinai peninsula thus this plan for a greater israel the odin Yunnan plan also ties in the plan to make israel the center of the internet for the entire world with the meeting point of all the fiber optic cables from the east meeting all the fiber optic cables from the west all going through israel one of the main things people are missing with this Greater Israel plan is how it is tied into population and how immigration is a major part of this, as currently the global population is crashing, soaring, and moving. Most countries, developed nations, are actually losing population with a much lower birth rate than needed to grow the population size, but not Israel. So despite the rest of the world losing population, the Israelis are actually growing in population size, not only from immigration, but also from internal births. The average Israeli woman averages 2.9 children, which is a much higher birth rate than most Western nations. And the extreme religious Jews have a birth rate of 6.6 .6 children which is much larger than any of their neighboring nations, which means the country is not only becoming more Jewish than Arab over time, they're growing the population size and they're becoming far more extremist. However, the number one way to grow the current state of Israel has always been immigration from Western nations. And recently that has ramped up to absolutely all-time new highs. You can see here 4,000 U.S. Jews moved to Israel in 2021, the most in nearly 50 years. Overall immigration was up 24% from 2020, which increased numbers of Olam from France, South Africa, and Argentina, as well as the U.S. So there you go. So even during the pandemic when no one is moving the Israelis and when everyone else is losing population the Israelis are growing in the types of population they want this isn't third world immigrants being shoved into their country this is high tech you know highly intelligent Jewish people moving back to Israel or moving to Israel for the first time and these people come with cybersecurity knowledge and all of that kind of information. While Syria is losing countless numbers of its citizens, this past year, Aliyah was up 128%. 60,000 new immigrants in the past Jewish year moved to Israel as of September 19th, 2022. Thus, Israel is growing due to immigration at an increasingly exponential rate. Article titled here, Four Reasons Why So Many Jews Moved to Israel in 2021. And you can see here they're saying 27,000 Olam moved across the globe arriving to Israel during 21, a 30% increase over the previous year, and the highest number of American Jews since the year 1973. So why are Americans moving to Israel? 
So how have they tricked so many Jews into running back to Israel? Well, they've increased anti-Semitism. Quote, we cannot ignore the fact that this wave of Leah took place at a time of heightened anxiety about anti-Semitism in the United States and around the world. According to the American Jewish Committee's largest ever survey of American Jews, 90% identified anti-Semitism as a problem, and over 80% believed it to be on the rise. Nearly a quarter of American Jews admitted that they have hidden their identity over the last year out of fear of anti-Semitism. And that can be attributed, in my opinion, to the rise of online media, which is controlled by Israel and used to drive up this fear of anti-Semitism to help drive Jews back to Israel to help the Greater Israel Project. So this rise of anti-Semitism on the internet is all by design to help drive immigration to Israel from all the high technology nations. They need immigration to be one of the only nations with positive population growth to justify the continued territorial expansion of the Israeli state as part of the greater Israeli plan. As you can see an example of this anti-Semitism here on the screen, it's just stuff like this that people are seeing in the youth, where the youth are saying stuff like, Bro, Hitler was awesome. This type of stuff is by design to drive immigration for this plan and to create this fake anti-Semitism in the youth. It's not like the youth are actual literal Nazis. No, those are just the ones being given standing ovations by the Canadians and Justin Trudeau. Those are the only actual Nazis out there. Lenin, the puppet of the bankers, knows how this works and stated, the best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves. And thus I give you the controlled opposition to Israel, the fake anti-Semites, like, oh, I don't know, Kanye West and Nick Fuentes. So this was an amazing expose by Big Tech. So Nick, for years, in his background, has had a blue Empire State Building. The only time the Empire State Building turns blue is once a year to commemorate the anniversary of the founding of Israel. So this whole time, it turns out Nick, Nick. in fact, was working for the Jews. Nick has been oy vey for pay all along. He's had it in his background as a secret dog whistle, like how Tucker Carlson had the secret, like, like Israeli ring or fucking necklace or whatever. Yeah. It turns out Nick Did was he? signaling that he was owned by the Jews the whole time, was hidden in plain sight. Yeah. This is Nick's Kabbalah bracelet, and he's being called out. Croatian underscore Hitler sent $3. Nick, is there a symbolic reason for putting the Empire State Building lit up in Israel colors for Israel's 75th anniversary as a background for the show? Is that true? what that is. Uh, I think it's just blue, isn't it? Look at how Semitic his nose is there. Look at it! I don't think that's what that is. Ah! In that moment, the nose was exposed. And look at his nose. Yeah. It grew three okay. sizes. No, By the is. way, he's looking back as though he could see what was on the green screen. It's a green screen. <laughs> he's playing dumb. He's looking back as though he can see the Empire State Building, but it's a green screen. <laughs> Another one of these big anti-Israel moments has happened this year, being led by these controlled opposition people like Nick Fuentes, was the hashtag ban the ADL, where Elon Musk had this big battle against the ADL. Yes, the same Elon Musk that is transferring all of your biometric data over to Israel. That same Elon Musk wanted to quote, ban the ADL, which never went anywhere. And he could have just banned them if he wanted to himself, but he didn't. So it was all just a big for the public drama show that never went anywhere. But some interesting things did come out of it. An Israeli intelligence officer, one Vivian Berkovici, 
fled yesterday's Twitter space when I asked her about her intelligence background. There were immediately a number of amendments made to her Wikipedia attempting to scrub her connection to Black Cube intelligence. So I find it very interesting that the very moment this lady is identified as being connected to Black Cube intelligence, they're able to edit Wikipedia. Obviously, Wikipedia, another thing run by the Israelis, quite clearly. And Black Cube Intelligence, as I said before, connects back to Harvey Weinstein, Epstein, all of those things once again, rearing their ugly head from this tiny little nation. The ADL is one of the most ridiculous, worst censorship organizations in the entire planet. They're embedded in things like YouTube to censor the internet. And they put out absolute nonsense, such as what you can see here, a quote, heat map. Yes, that's right. A map of all the extremely anti-Semitic and other extremely hateful incidents that are taking place out there in a map to scare you. I mean, look at the like everywhere in the entire East Coast is just full of hate crimes. Okay, every moment of the day, hate crimes on the East Coast, just in the year 2023. The ADL is so ridiculous. I bet if you looked into 90% of these, they would all be hoaxes or taken like out of context and things of that nature. The ADL should be banned, but this of course went nowhere. Elon Musk did nothing. Nothing ever happened and the ADL will continue on censoring everyone and driving up this crazy anti-Semitism narrative to further the greater Israel plan by increasing immigration through fear to Israel. And with all this anti-Semitism going on out there in the world, it is driving up Israel's population at a, quote, dizzying rate. <laughs> Since the end of World War II, almost no nation has been able to gain territory in any sort of conflict, yet one, Israel. Israel has grown from the year 1947 to not only be somewhat larger, but significantly larger than it was, and it's one of the only nations in the world that continues to grow in size through conflict. For instance, Israel has recently taken Syria's Golan Heights and just claimed it as its territory, and the United States backed that up, Trump backed that up, and Biden has also backed that up, and no one is going to change that, and Israel just expanded its borders into another nation's territory, and nothing is being done about that. No other nation on earth could get away with that. So you can see how the Greater Israeli Project actually does form and take place and is actually happening with things such as the seizure of the Golan Heights right here. Israel does this piece by piece over time as the bankers think in terms of generations, not in terms of five-year plans. And as the generations go on, Israel will reclaim the greater is Israel project lands and the Israelis will justify their border expansion by stating that their population is increasing while their neighbors is decreasing and it's now Israeli citizens li living in these lands and this is exactly how they will justify it as you can see here health ministry reveals decline in net population growth in Egypt and this is happening to all of the nations that surround Israel. They are all shrinking in population size while Israel is growing in population size. You can see here the population of Syria took a major hit due to the war. It was on an exponential growth increase. And then the wars happened, which was started by ISIS, which was funded by the West and the bankers, and then you saw the population of Syria decline. Now Israel is taking their territory and justifying it because the Syrians need less territory if they have less people, right? And no, the war in Syria is not without having the bankers on both sides as always. Even the Israelis want Assad to stay in power. The entire thing was just a war for the bankers to 
destroy the infrastructure of Syria, to lower the population of Syria, to allow Israel to expand into the Golan Heights, and other things of that nature. The Israelis are not even against Assad. Article reads, Israel would prefer that Bashar Assad hold on to the presidency in Syria rather than leave a power vacuum that could be filled by Islamic radicals, according to former IDF chief of staff Dan Halutz. The regime in Syria kills its citizens every day, but we must acknowledge that the opposition in Syria is composed of Muslim extremists like Al-Qaeda. He said at a fundraising event for Israel's Tel Hashemer Hospital in Moscow on Monday. Notice he's in Russia delivering this. According to the Daily Mariv, the question, what is better for Israel? <clears throat> I'll repeat again. The regime in Syria kills its citizens every day, but the question is, what is better for Israel? So you should ask yourself, with every decision you make, is this good for the company? And to further confirm this, a member in the Israeli Knesset, Yal Ben Reuven, has said that it is in Israel's interest that the role of the Syrian regime president, Bashar al-Assad, continues. Quote, this regrettable but a realistic view of the complex situation shows the stability of the murder, Bashar Assad's rule, is pure Israeli interest. Israel Mariv newspaper quoted Ben Reuven of the Zionist Union as saying, The stability of the murderous Bashar Assad's rule is pure Israeli interest. Keep that in mind the next time they're telling you Israel is bombing Syria. So stop listening to alt media that has not told you about what the Great Reset really is, this shift to the East. The same alt media that wants you to think that Bashar al-Assad walks down the streets of Syria with rose petals being put at his feet by the locals when in fact the country is on a verge of collapse. So why is Israel bombing Syrian airports? Well, it's certainly not to remove Assad from power. It seems what they're trying to do is lower the population of Syria and ensure that no one is able to return. Now, I hope you can understand what their plans are, what this actual Great Reset is, and what the Belt and Road Wars are. And now that you've understood what the problem is, what can we do about it? You can defeat the elite by sharing this information, by raising up awareness of the information in this documentary and bringing people to our cause. If we don't win the information war, we have no chance at winning the rest of the war against this elite that has infiltrated our countries. And we need to stand up for our individual nation sovereignties and defend ourselves from this infiltration from within by the banksters. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to ride. I don't want you to write to your congressmen because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. What's up, y'all? I'm the last man on earth. Shit's all fucked up. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We out here.